But tonight, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our special guest. Lord Michael Levy is perhaps one of the Jewish community's most influential leaders of all time. And he is not just the president of JRGB, but also the president of Jewish Care, JFS, Barnet and Southgate Colleges, Sense and Sense International. Born in 1944 to Samuel and Annie Levy, Michael grew up in Stoke Newington in North London. Leaving school to become a chartered accountant in 1966, he set up a professional accountancy practice that quickly built up a range of clients in the music and entertainment industry, with clients such as the Foundations, creators of the JLGB Party Classics, Build Me Up Buttercup and Baby Now That I Found You. With a successful client list, Michael founded Magnet Records in 1973, which became one of the most successful independent labels of its day having launched the careers of both Alvin Stardust and Chris Rea. He would go on to sell his record label to the Warner Brothers in 1988, so he could put his energy into fundraising for charities, raising over £60 million for Jewish care alone between 1988 and 1994. His reputation brought him to contract with young Tony Blair, where they became close friends. Soon after, Michael would become Labour's chief fundraiser, which led to Tony Blair's monumental 1997 general election victory. For his contributions to the music, non-profit and political sectors, he was granted a life period in September 1997 and became Baron Michael Levy of Mill Hill. He then became special envoy to the Middle East for Tony Blair, where Lord Levy was commended by both Israelis and Palestines for offering constructive suggestions and building lasting relationships in the region. In 2007, Lord Levy took on the position of president of JRGB and has been fundamentally and simply phenomenally in helping JRGB reach its potential to national acclaim as a leading youth and charity organisation. Taking his time out of his incredibly hectic schedule, we are so honoured and thrilled that he has been able to join us this evening and tell us more about his life, his journey, his vision and his future. He just told me that he wants to be referred as Michael throughout the interview. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's very special and honoured guest, Lord Michael Levy. Welcome Lord Levy, we are absolutely privileged to have you on the show tonight and I'm honoured to be chosen to lead tonight's interview with you. How are you? Has lockdown been treating you and how are you keeping positive during this difficult time? I'm great but I can't say lockdown has been great. It's mm. very difficult for me. I'm normally out there three, four lunches a week, two, three dinners a week. So this is a very different lifestyle for me but you know we've got to cope, we've all got to get through it. And that's all there is to it. We've got to stay positive. End of. Very different for everybody. So I'm sure everybody's struggling. So we are really pleased to have you on Judge Me Virtual tonight. We've been boosting positivity and keeping children and their families active, healthy and entertained for 14 weeks now since lockdown began, with the help of a special guest each evening, many of whom you persuaded to join. Your video message was the first item shown on our debut virtual evening 14 weeks ago on March the 23rd. But now, almost 50 episodes later, it's so great that you're here with us live to celebrate JLGB's proud but humbling achievements during this pandemic. Why was it so important for you to join us this evening? Well, I think the whole idea of doing this every evening has just been phenomenal. It's captured the mood. It has captured the imagination of the community. And I have to tell you, people tell me, Michael, this is brilliant what JLGB are doing. People that have been on and been interviewed, people that I perhaps gently or even a little more harshly twisted their arm behind their back. After they've done it, they say, Michael, that was great. Thanks so much for asking me to do it or even persuading me to do it. Because, you know, we're all in lockdown. Guys on at school, studying during the day, but you're entertained in the evening. And to have speakers from all walks of life talking to you, asking them questions, learning about what they've achieved in their lives. And that's just so important. And you guys have done it on your own. You're doing the interviews, Sydney. 
And there are so many who have done interviews, the questions from all around the country, all the groups of JLGB, absolutely brilliantly, how can I say, organized by Neil Martin and all of his team. This is you doing it for the community. We're merely a little part of this. You guys have done it, you're doing it, and frankly, you're showing our community the way. You're leading the way, and you're our future, and that's what's so important. So for me to do it tonight is frankly both a pleasure and an honor to be part of this. And to all my friends, and I've got a lot more lined up in your next session as well, that will be a lot of fun, and I'm not gonna give you some of the names because I don't wanna spoil the fun, but it's really, really exciting. So it's for me to thank you, it's for me to thank everyone who's been involved in this program in GLGB because you've led the way for our community and you've shown us how to do it. So thanks. Well, thank you for coming on the show. We're all about acts of kindness at GLGB, underpinned by our Evolve Awards. And we always ask our guests what they've been doing to help others at this time. Now, when it comes to supporting others, there are not many people more generous than you. You lead, guide and fundraise for so many key Jewish charities. But is there a more personal act of kindness that you've maybe done to help your friends or local community during this pandemic, which has been particularly hard on the Jewish community? Well, it's been a very tough period for me because in actual fact, I've lost four people who I was very close to. One of my closest friends, Michael Goldmayer, um, died at the very beginning of this COVID crisis. They were with us for Shabbat dinner, early March. A week later, he took on, he became unwell. A week later in hospital and a week later he passed away. Sorry. And having his widow, Philippa, come to see us regularly, speak to her, has been very, very important for Gilda and myself, my wife and I, during this period. I also um, lost a very dear rabbi that I've known for years, Rabbi Avram Pinter from the Haredi community in Stanford Hill. And he literally phoned me, Erev Pesach, Erev Seder. I could hardly hear him. He could hardly breathe, let alone talk. And he said, Michael, I'm at University College. I'm just going into intensive care. I said, Avram, is that you? And he said, Michael, it's me. And he was there over the Chag. He was there for 10 days and then he died. And I was able to get the body out of University College so that it could get to Israel before Yontif, so that he could have the burial there, which was, I had to use some juice to do that. Unfortunately, a very close friend, my lawyer in Israel, also died during this period, someone I'd known for 40 years. And I made the eulogy during the uh, Shiva, obviously on Zoom. And then someone in our community, Stanley Michaels, Rabbi Stanley Michaels, who I saw every Shabbat, taught the Bar Mitzvah boys. He also died of COVID in the same hospital as Michael. So this has been a tough period. And for me, trying to identify with what happened has made it very personal. And when I was doing the fundraising for an emergency appeal for Jewish care, because the homes were so badly hit in our residential homes, um, we did some prayers with the small group who are on that Zoom meetings each night for Michael. And that was very, very emotional for me. And I just want to thank the team at Jewish Care, the chairman, Stephen Lewis, I know has been on your JLGB program, to Daniel Carmel Brown, the chief exec, who's also been on, um, Adam Dawson's been on, who's the chairman of Jamie, uh, Laurie Rosenberg, the chief exec of Jamie, all of these people have just done an amazing job. And I think what's really hit me during this period of Sydney is how we've been united, how we've worked together, how when someone's had a down moment, someone's lifted them. And to me, that is crucial because my generation has been in total lockdown and I've literally just been outside my gate to go for a walk down the lane. And you know, for me to live like that is, has been extraordinarily difficult. I'm out there, I'm hugging, I'm schmoozing, and you know, I'm known as the key hugger and schmoozer, and who am I hugging at the moment? Thank God my wife, but that's it. 
even my son and daughter and my little granddaughter aren't allowed in the house. So it's tough. And I think chesed and really showing love and kindness to people, particularly those who've really, really had tragedies hit them, has been what I've been focused on apart from what I've been doing for the community. Kindness is key. I'm so sorry for all of your losses. So let's go back to the very beginning then, if I may. So mm. can you tell us a little bit more about your childhood experiences? I read in your book that you grew up with no bath at your home in Hackney. What youth opportunities did you have that helped shape you? Your father was the Shamas of the Shul. Did this help you sh shape your Jewish identity? Very much so. We, we lived in one room um, and I went to a public bath, was supposed to, I tried to bunk off as often as I could. It wasn't very nice. I went to a public bath once a week and my life really was school, then Hebrew classes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, straight after school. I had to even go and learn on Shabbat afternoon and then Hebrew classes for three hours on a Sunday morning. Dad ran the shul, as you say, he was the shaman, so I was there at the shul where I got bar mitzvah, married. Um, but then when I was 16, 17, I started to take the children's services in a shawl in Clapton, Leibridge Road, where I walked there from Stanford Hill. And then I started to teach. I was a qualified teacher. And I went all the way from Stanford Hill to Croydon, three hours each way, three hours teaching. So that was nine hours. And I had the princely sum of a pound um, for doing that. But, you know, that was a lot of money in those days and really that was that was my upbringing and I remember when my late mum picked me up from school and we went to what was called Ridley Road Market and if she bought me an apple that was a treat and if she bought me a peach wow that was something <laughs> amazing and you know I was a lucky boy I had a great upbringing the most loving parents but often mummy would stretch a meal so it lasted two or three meals but you know I have no regrets. I had wonderful parents who showed me much love, gave me every encouragement in life and really helped me and make, made me understand the real values in life. So that, Cindy, was, was my upbringing. Very, very different to, I'm sure, many of you guys who are, are on this tonight. But, you know, our upbringing shapes us all and um, in different ways. And we should all be proud of our upbringing, proud of our family, and certainly proud of our parents. Thank you for sharing some such personal stories, not only with me, but everyone watching so far. So I'm going to stop speaking for a minute, and I'm going to go to a couple of audience questions. So our first one is from Talia Toombs from Cardiff, Georgia. Hi, Talia. Hello. Hi. Hi, Talia. Um, so they say behind every great man is a great woman. So how did you first meet your wife, Gilda? I heard you try to impress her with your jive skills. And how crucial has she been by your side all these years? Well, I'll tell you. So I, you were in Cardiff, are you? Mm-hmm. So my mummy was born down the road in Brimau. Okay. <laughs> So I can give you the Welsh national anthem, my inlad van edai, etc. But you asked me about Gilda. Gilda has been my total strength. We've been married nearly 53 years. Um, I proposed to her after three weeks. Her mum literally went white green and nearly killed over when she told her we were getting engaged. Um, the best decision I ever made. She's an incredibly bright, beautiful woman who is really my best friend, my partner, and has been with me through absolutely every part of my life. And as many people would say, she's my better half. But where did I meet her? Well, I just said, when I took the children's services in Hebrew Road Shore, and I saw this beautiful girl going to shore. And I asked her to come up and watch my children's service, but I had real ulterior motives. And she did come up, and she was the only Jewish girl at her college. She was at college with Helen Mirren. She did drama and English. 
And that's how it all started. And three weeks later, I proposed. Thank God she accepted. And then we were married. And that's how it all started. So, Talia, very personal. But there you've got the whole story. Okay, so thanks. Thank you so much, Talia. Our next question is from JLGB's National Youth Representative, Keely Price from Kingston. Hi there. Um, you qualified as an accountant in 1966, but is it true that you originally chose to study accountancy rather than practicing law by a toss of a coin? Heads for law, tails for accountancy. And so my question is, do you ever imagine what might have happened if it were heads and you ended up in law? Wow, that's an interesting question, Caitlin. You're absolutely right. I was, I had a place at LSE. I was in the sixth form and frankly, I was most of the time in a tracksuit. I was a pretty good athlete. I ran for London in New England. I was a sprinter. I was the Jewish youth champion under 11, under 13, under 16 sprint. And I just thought, you know what? This isn't fair on my parents. They're struggling enough. Um, let me go into a profession. My mum wanted to be a doc, wanted me to be a doctor or a rabbi, so she was somewhat disappointed. But yeah, I did go home. I said, Mum, I'm going to leave school, but I promise I'm going to qualify in a profession. Took a coin, flicked it, and as you rightly say, it came down that I did accountancy. I often wonder what it would have been like, and it's a fascinating question, had I have done law. Um, I think I would have enjoyed law. I think I'd have enjoyed being a lawyer, perhaps a barrister. But, you know, you don't look back, you don't regret. I've had a very lucky and charmed life. Um, but in some ways, I'm a frustrated lawyer. Because when I was in business, my lawyer always used to really get worried when I checked a contract. Because he said, you're the only client that's going to find some errors in the contract. So my real answer to you is, in some way, I probably still am. A little frustrated lawyer but no one's ever asked me that before so thank you very much thank you for sharing thank you Keely so back to me for a minute you went on to become the in-house accountant for a record and music business which as it grew enabled you to handle your first music account for a band whose music is still popular today and whose song, Build Me Up Buttercup, has affectionately become your signature tune that our JLGB band also plays for you. Tell us about working with the foundations and how this success began your music career that would lead you to find Magnet Records, the most successful independent labels of its day, which at one time had four singles in the top 10 at the same time. Well, fascinating. So Build Me Up Buttercup, baby. Baby, now that I found you, I just love you so. They were great. The foundations were a tremendous band, real characters. Um, I went to America for them, where they had several number ones. And I learned the business. And I learned the business very much through them, through looking after their affairs, dealing with their contracts. And I found the business fascinating. I found it exciting. In those days, music business was a really exciting business. And I was very lucky. I acted for the Beatles producer as well. The guys who wrote um, Last Waltz, Delilah, I Wanna Teach the World to Sing. Some of these songs you guys may not know. But I acted for all of these people. And then I had a client that I thought was really talented. And I could get a deal for him. So a very close friend who was also a client was the one boss of CBS. And he said, Michael, why don't you back this guy yourself? And I said, what with? I don't have capital. I'm doing very well, but I don't really have serious capital. And he said, don't worry, we'll help you. So I went to the bank, I agreed to lend some money. And that was the birth of Magnet. And the first record you guys probably don't know was Albin Stardust, Kukachu, Ku. Cool. I love you too. Anyway, it went to number two, and the next one was Jealous Mine, and that went to number one. And suddenly, I had a business. So I was running a professional practice, going in the evening to run the music business. I was absolutely exhausted. And then I thought, well, there's a conflict of interest here. So I sold my professional practice, and there I was in rock and roll. And my 
you know, my parents could never really understand their son, the chartered accountant, is suddenly in the music business. And that's how it happened. And it all started really from looking after the foundations who came into the office looking for an accountant. And, you know, you never know what happens. And let me give a message to all of you guys who are watching. Grab every opportunity in life because you never know what can happen. The worst thing is it won't work. The best thing is it can be a tremendous success. But unless you grasp the opportunity, you never know. And as I've often said, when there's a hurdle in front of you, jump over it, duck under it, get by it. Because we all have hurdles in life, but we've got to get round those hurdles if we really want to achieve and to have success. But a great question, and I, I always have a great smile on my face when the band starts to play Build Me Up Buttercup. So thanks for asking that. It's actually really inspirational. I'll definitely take that with me. Uh, our next question is from Izzy Massim from Redbridge, Georgia. Hi. 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 Um, Izzy. I have a few questions. They're also about music. So, um, two of your major acts were Alvin Stardust and Chris Rea. How did you discover them? And I believe one allowed you to choose his stage name, but the other one insisted he kept his real one. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Wow, you guys really know what's going on. So, we had this record written and sung by Peter Shelley. Peter didn't want to fund it. And the record was My Cuckoo. And it started to get fantastic airplay, but we needed an artist to front it. So a guy came in called Shane Fenton, blonde hair, good looking guy. And we looked at him and said, no, this isn't the image we want. We want something much stronger, much more rock and roll. But he was desperate for the gig. And we said, but you're going to be named Alvin Stardust. So he said, that's not a problem. Anyway, he came back two days later, black leather outfit, black gloves, black ring. And we said, wow. And jet black hair, of course. And that was Alvin Stardust. And that was the birth of Alvin Stardust. And he was the most fabulous guy. Tragically, he died just a few years ago. He was actually, the funeral was in, was in Swansea Cathedral. And I went up there and I made the main eulogy at his funeral. He was a wonderful guy. They gave him a massive Harley Davidson send off after his funeral. He was just a brilliant personality. He was great with the media and one of the most lovely artists I've had the pleasure of working with. And I shed some tears when I spoke at his funeral. A really special artist. And we were blessed that he had hit after hit and was a mega artist all around the world. And that's how it started. And he changed his name from Shane Fenton, where he'd had quite a bit of success before. Chris Rea was very different, a lad from Middlesbrough, but we signed. His album was produced by Gus Dudgeon, who did the Elton John stuff. And um, we just said, Chris Rea, is that really the right name? And we came up with the name Benny Santini. And in his very northern plump way, he said, you ain't going to call me Benny Santini. And we couldn't argue with him. And we said, fine, you're Chris Rea. That's what it will be. And his first album, he really wanted to wind us up. And he called it Whatever Happened to Benny Santini. And it went on to win a Grammy in America. He's an amazingly talented artist. If you guys haven't heard some of the albums, you should really get Road to Hell, a wonderful, wonderful album. Fooled If You Think It's Over was also nominated for a Grammy. And we had some wonderful years um, with Chris, but he wouldn't let us change his name. You're absolutely right. But you know, so often um, artists use stage names, have different names and, Many of the top artists in the world do that. But Chris was one that said, no way, you're not going to let me change my bloody name. And we didn't change his name. So there you go. But boy, you're well informed. Mm. OK, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Definitely an album that I'll add on the playlist for tomorrow. 
So sadly though, in 1987, while you were on a business trip in Japan, your mother suffered a stroke. You returned to the UK and spent six weeks at her bedside while she lay in a coma. While she couldn't actually speak, you very felt, much felt that she was communicating with you, saying, Michael, you've done well, but now it's time to look at your life again and change it. This was to create a massive change in your life. Do you mind telling us about this turning point and how you shot the music industry by selling the big business to begin your life of charity service? Yes, it was a very emotional period. My late dad died a couple of years after I started the business in 1975. He was just 65. I am an only child. I was totally devoted to my mum and really worshipped her. Never a day went by without me speaking to her and also to Gilda's mum, whom I adored as well. We were in Japan. Chris Rea had just broken very big there. We'd gone from Tokyo to Osaka on the bullet train, been to his gig, which was a fantastic occasion, went back to the hotel, and there was an urgent message from my daughter, well, actually, then my doctor after my daughter, and, Mike, you've got to get back to London. Mum is very bad. I don't know if she's going to make it through. The company that represented us in Japan, JVC, were amazing. The boss of JVC organized everything, got us from Osaka back to Tokyo. We actually signed the new contract in the back of the car on the way to the airport, came back to London. I'll never forget the ride from the airport to the hospital. She came through it, but it was a very difficult period. She had an amputation. And the next period was turmoil for me. And she couldn't talk, she had had a stroke. And I felt she gave me a message, Michael, change your lifestyle. I don't know what the message was. I don't know if my interpretation was right. But she then passed away. One of the reasons I really got involved with the then welfare board and helped to create Jewish care was because I turned to them for some help. After mummy died in the period of 30 days, strict mourning, I phoned my lawyer and said, Tony, I want to have a private dinner, although he was on my board of directors. And I said, Tony, I want to sell. I want to change, just change my life. And he gave me the most obvious reason why I shouldn't sell then. And I said, Tony, I'm not interested. If I get the right deal, and all the big boys wanted to buy us. I said, I want to change my life. And I did, and I sold in the, she passed away in the December. In the February, the deal was agreed. And I sold, as you, um, Cindy said, to Warner Brothers. And they then wanted me to stay on and be their global consultant. And I said, no, I really want out. And that was it. I then did start another um, label for a bit of fun, really. And we had a massive hit with Zoe, Sunshine on a Rainy Day. You may have heard it. Um, but my heart wasn't in it anymore. And I really, really gave my life to charity, community, and then to a young man called Tony Blair. And we became best buddies. And when I first met him, little did one think he'd be the leader of the Labour Party, let alone the next Prime Minister because um, John Smith was the leader of the party. It was thought Gordon Brown would take over from him. John Smith had a sudden heart attack and died. Tony became leader, not Gordon. He became prime minister in 97. And as they say, the rest is history. Um, but that tragic event with mummy changed my life very dramatically. And as I said before, different times in life have different reasons and different end results. And we should all just look at why we want to do something. And if we do it, we really do it. And then we grab the next opportunity and we put our heart and soul into that. Because if you'd have said to me, Michael, after selling out, you'll end up in the House of Lords, 
will end up as the personal envoy tantamount to foreign secretary for the prime minister for 10 years i just said come on stop dreaming you're nuts but it happened and so we never really know what's around the corner so once again we need to take every opportunity grasp it and make the most of it thank you for being so open with us i really appreciate it so our next question then after that is going to come from former JFS pupil, Emily Diamond. Hi there. Hi, Emily. Um, so from a young age, you were involved in many Jewish and Israeli causes, but as their president, both Jewish Care and JFS have both been especially close to your heart for many years. How did you first get involved with Jewish Care and JFS? Emily, thank you. Firstly, did you enjoy your time at JFS? Yes, I did. Thank you. I was there for sixth form and it was a really lovely experience. Great. And what are you doing now? Um, I'm at uni becoming a primary teacher. Oh, wow. Great. Well, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> so let's deal with Jewish care first. I really touched upon it just now. When mummy had the amputation, I was totally distraught. She had her arm amputated. And in actual fact, it happened on Rosh Hashanah. I never would answer the phone in Rosh Hashanah. And suddenly the phone rang, it was a hospital. Um, you need to come immediately. And I said, I'm sorry, it's a Jewish holiday. My mother knows I won't be there for two days um, because the hospital was in town, the university college, we live in the suburbs. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. She's going to have an amputation. You've got to come straight away. I was totally in shell shock. Went to Shaw, spoke to the rabbi and said, look, he said, you've got to go. I did something I'd never done in my life before in Rosh Hashanah, got in the car and went to the hospital. I phoned my, my doctor, who's been one of my closest friends for the last 50 years. He met me at the hospital. I remember our Rosh Hashanah lunch was a couple of dry biscuits. Mummy had the amputation. It was horrendous. We had to bury the arm on its own um, several days later. And I was really in a very bad way and I needed some help. And I turned to the welfare board and they were amazing. And of course they sort of grabbed me and they said, Mike, you've got to help us. And they were, had started talks with what was in the Jewish Blind Society. And I was honored to be the first chairman that hadn't been involved with either of the organizations before and the creation of Jewish Care. And two terrific guys, Jeffrey Greenwood and David Lewis, who were chairs of the Welfare Board and the Blind Society, um, were there at my side helping me. And it was the birth of Jewish Care. And when I look back over the years from being chairman to president, it really is the most organized, wonderful organization and over this last year, Stephen Lewis has been an amazing chairman. Um, before that, um, Michael Goldman, Malcolm Daigle, there were some really terrific people who had chaired Jewish care. And it's something I look at today as the largest organization in Anglo Jewry, with a budget with revenue and capital approaching 100 million, looking after over 10,000 people every day. 1,500 staff, 3,000 volunteers, and it's probably one of the proudest things in my life. In terms of JFS, that was very different. My late dad went to JFS when it was in the East End, and the head teacher many years ago, Joe Wageman, a wonderful lady, found out that my dad had gone, and again wanted to grab me, and said, Michael, I need you involved in JFS. And I went on the governing body and then she said, Michael, we've got to move out of this school in Camden. We must have a new school in a new location. Only you'll be able to do this. And together with a guy called Arnold Wagner, who's the chair of governors, and then Dame Ruth Robin, who was the head teacher then, the site was found in Kenton and the most fabulous campus was built. I literally took a year out when I walk around the school and I see all the names, I think, oh my God, did I blag you for money? Did I get money from you? And I got Tony Blair to open the school and he just looked around and he said, turned to me and he said, Michael, I don't know how you do it. 
you got fortunes from all these people and they're still here, they're still hugging you and they still love you. And that was a wonderful moment when the school opened. And I give an annual lecture, as you probably know, the last lecture to year 13 before they leave school. And it's a wonderful school. Head teacher there, Rachel Fink now, and the chair of governors, Andrew Moss. And it really is a very special school. I'm thrilled you went, went there for years 12 and 13, and good luck for your future. And to anyone else who's listening, who's at JFS or who's an alumnus of JFS, it's a great school. And we're very blessed today to have some wonderful Jewish schools in the community. There's Jacos, I know Cindy, you're at Jacos, there's Yavna, there's Cantor King Solomon. We're blessed today with some great schools, some great primary schools, and they weren't around in my day. And our community is, is really blessed today to have these schools. And JFS, because of my dad having gone there, is also very close to my heart, as is Jewish care. And of course, as is JLGB, I don't get involved in anything unless it becomes close to my heart. I'm not very gray. I'm black or white. Either I do it or I don't do it. Either I love it or I don't. And when I'm involved and I love it, I'm an all the way merchant. I go all the way and I give my heart and soul to what I'm involved in and the organizations that I'm privileged and blessed to be the titular head of. So great question and I hope that's answered you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. And just for a little insight, in the Zoom at the moment, we've currently got 100 supporters from JLGB, Jewish Care, JFS, and Rachel Fink is also in the Zoom. So thank you all for joining. Our next question is from Josh Cohen from Mill Hill, who meets in your synagogue every week. Oh, well. Wow. Hi. 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 How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks. I'm, I've enjoyed the interview so far. Thanks for your answers. Really, Great. Thank really, you. Yeah. Um, so many in the charity sector um, and also just in politics in the UK have called you the UK's best fundraiser, helping to raise millions of pounds for charities alone. Um, what, what's your secret? Are you, are you ever afraid people might say no? Um, or what tips can you share with us on how it's done? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josh, thanks, and good to see you. Um, boy, one day we'll be able to get back to shul, I hope. Okay. So, Josh, <laughs> the answer to you is, the worst anyone can say to you is no. When you ask for money, you're not asking for yourself. Thank God I've never asked anyone for a cup of tea. So the worst thing when you're asking someone for money is they turn you down and they say no. That's the worst that can happen. And you've got to have the guts and you've got to be bold and you've got to ask someone for money. It's about schmooze. It's no different to selling. It's no different to achieving anything one achieves in life. I have a particular style. I do schmooze. I do have the arm round. I am a hugger. But you know, the good news, Josh, is after doing this for perhaps going on for 50 years, wow, I can still go to the same people I can still phone them up. I mean, there's one particular person who I've got fortunes from. He says, right, I'm timing you. Is this gonna be 50,000 a second or 100,000 a second? And he really winds me up. But it's great because I know that he cares. I know he listens to me and he's never let me down. And he's always been there when a charity has needed money. And, you know, it's, and you also have to assess, Josh, who you're asking. And, you know, giving money, if someone's giving 10 pounds or 50 pounds or 100 pounds, if that's what they can afford, then that's generous. And one appreciates that and shows the respect and the gratitude for that gift. If someone has really been blessed in life and had great success, and they can write out a check for a million pounds, do you know, great as well. But sometimes the guy giving a hundred pounds, it's more difficult for them than the guy running out the check for the million pounds. And so it's horses for courses. It's never being afraid to ask. It's assessing who you're asking, trying to get on with them. And the most important thing, Josh, is to understand the charity that you're asking for. And to know that charity is doing a great job 
it has accountability, that it's run properly, that it has strong governance in place, has a strong board of trustees and is run well. And therefore asking for Jewish care, asking for JLGV, asking for JFS, asking for primary schools that I, I had as well, um, asking for Sense and Sense International who look after the deaf and blind in the non-Jewish world. One should be proud of asking for money. And, you know, it's very interesting, Josh, that often when someone gives a gift for the first time, they feel so good about themselves. And often people just haven't been asked. And when they're asked and they give a gift, they somehow, they just feel so good. They think, wow, I'm now a person of charity. This is what I've done. So the key is to unlock. Everyone has goodness in them. Everyone wants to do something. Everyone wants to give. It's a matter of turning that key, asking in the right way, asking for the right charity. So Josh, as I'm sure a future potential fundraiser, and that applies to everyone on this. Let's make sure that we're not ashamed of asking. There's no harm in asking. And often by asking someone, it is then when they give a gift that they feel good about themselves and they feel suddenly it's changed their life. So that probably is the key and the secret of fundraising. And I've often given lectures on it. I've spoken to the Institute of Fundraisers, had fundraisers from all different charities from around the country. And that's what it's about. Being proud of what you're doing, never being ashamed of asking, but making sure that the charity you're asking for does what it says on the tin. Because if it doesn't, then you've got problems. Josh, I appreciate you asking that question. and Look forward to seeing you again soon as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hopefully see you soon. Please go ahead. Thanks, Josh. Our next question is going to come from Talia Levinson from Borenwood, Jalchebe. Hi. Hi, Talia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. So, as you know, the Jewish community is an ageing population, but for many, age is now just a number. People are living longer, they're more active, and they want to be much more independent in their old age. So what do you think that Jewish care will need to look like in the future? Wow, that is a challenging question. Well, you know, I try not to, on a personal level, feel old. Yeah. I still work out every day. I still try and swim every day. Yeah. Play tennis three times a week, normally and try and keep fit. When I started in Jewish care many years ago, the average age in our residential homes was probably late 60s, early 70s. The average age today is probably late 80s, early 90s, and we have a number of residents who celebrated their 100th birthday. That's amazing. That, that is quite something. Yeah. And, you know, I call our day centres the youth clubs for the elderly because they go there. Some of our volunteers are well in their 80s. And it's so sad for them now that the day centres have had to close and they can't go. They serve meals. They help those who have disability. And, you know, it's a great place for people to go, our day centres. Our Holocaust Survivors Centre. I mean, you see the vibrancy of people in their 80s and early 90s. I mean... It, Honestly, it's just, it's just amazing. And some of the volunteers we have in our residential homes are also in their late 70s and their early 80s. So constantly the Board of Trustees of Jewish Care, and I'm sure Stephen and Daniel would have told you this, are looking at how we improve our newest home on the Sandringham Estate in Stanmore, I call it a seven star hotel. You walk in, it's truly palatial, but the care is so wonderful as well. And, you know, hopefully Jewish care will adapt, will make sure we care for the aging population in our community. But it does become more difficult because dementia is something that really just not strikes our community, but is hitting so many communities. 
And it's very sad to see people who have their physical ability, but tragically are suffering from dementia. And so, you know, my answer is, Jewish care has adapted over the years to the changing aging population within Anglo Jewry. And with the trustees we've got, who are a really vibrant young bunch, um, they're going to move with the times. And I'm sure Jewish care in the future will adapt with the times because that's what a good charity does. Um, as JLGB has 125 years. Look at JLGB tonight. Look at what you guys are doing. Look what you're achieving. Look how things have changed. Compare it to 125 years ago. I mean, that's what a good organization does. It adapts, it changes. And I'm sure what was Jewish Free School, JFS, how that has adapted and changed over the years. Um, and to have a former head teacher, uh, a former, excuse me, head girl of the school, now the head teacher. You know, th these, are, these are wonderful times we're in. And as a community, we will adapt and change. And we'll make sure we will always serve our community in the best way. And that's really the best way I can answer you because, you know, an average age of late 60s, early 70s, when I got involved 30 odd years ago to an average age in late 80s, early 90s, that is a tremendous difference. And, you know, sometimes people come in a home, perhaps really unwell, perhaps they would think a few months to live. And they've had such good care that X number of years later, they're still enjoying life in the home because it gives them a new lease of life. And if we can continue to do that, then we continue to serve our community well. So that's the that's best really answer. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Talia. Our next question is going to come from Jamie Smokler from Barnet JLGB. Good evening, Lord Levy. How are you? I'm good, Jamie. How are you? What's that shirt you're wearing? I, it's just a shirt. Um, I'm very well, thank I, you. I thought it was a football shirt. Sorry, I can't oh, see Oh, no, not, not tonight, not tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening and, of course, for your support throughout um, for JLGB throughout this lockdown period. You've convinced a large, large number of guests to come on to our virtual programme and you continue to show us incredible support. Um, you, Jewish Care, we've just spoken about, has been at the front of our community's response to this pandemic. We have previously spoken to the CEO, Daniel Carmel Brown, one of the trustees, Rachel Anticoni. Um, I've had the privilege of interviewing the chairman of Jamie, Adam Dawson, who could have been a fellow barrister of yours had that coin that you flipped landed on heads, um, as well as last week, the chairman of Jewish Care, Stephen Lewis, both of whom I know are watching this evening. So what has been your role um, as president during this crisis? And how do you feel about when you, when you hear how proud and supportive the entire community have been of Jewish care, how do you feel? Well, first of all, it's great that you've interviewed these people, Jamie. Well done. Um, Stephen Lewis, I've known for many years and I, um, I regard him as a, a real friend and a great young man. Um, not since, quite as young as he used to be, but um, he's done an outstanding job as chairman. Daniel Carmel Brown, as chief executive, frankly, has worked 24 seven during this crisis and has just been just really out, you know, amazing, outstanding. Adam Dawson, I've known from when he was head of the Union of Jewish Students, um, just a terrific young man, helped create Eights High in School, now chair of Jamie. And um, who else have you had on? And the chief exec of uh, Jamie, uh, Laurie, who's another terrific guy. Rachel Anticoni has done an amazing job. She's the chief operating officer of the Royal Free. And with all that responsibility, she's still given so much time to Jewish care during this crisis period. So my role as president, I suppose, is the older statesman. I know the organization backwards. Um, and I'm blessed that I have such a close relationship with Stephen, Daniel, Rachel, Adam, the trustees of Jewish Care, the chairman elect, Jonathan Zenyos. They're a terrific bunch. And my role has been, hopefully, to have been inspirational, to have led the campaign for the emergency fund for COVID. And within a few days, 
we met daily on a Zoom and we brought in over four million pounds, not just for Jewish care, but for the other residential homes in our community as well. Um, and I suppose my role is to lead from the front, be inspirational, and to be there for Daniel, for Stephen, Adam, Rachel, everybody, um, and to work closely with them. They make their decisions. They're all very capable people. But the role of the president is, as I'm sure Neil Martin will tell you on JLGB, to always be there, to always be a shoulder to lean on and to really do whatever is necessary from the front. And that's, as I've seen my role, it is hands on, but I will never cross a chairman or a chief executive. I will always believe that they have to do what they've got to do. And fortuitously, there's always been that respect that we've been able to work together because the only way to run any organization well is to have teamwork. When someone goes out on their own and they don't carry a team behind them, it will never work. Look at you guys this evening, you're a team. I can see that you interact, you work together, you know each other, you'll spend some camp together, you're in groups together, you relate to Neil, the professional staff. That's what it is when an organization is successful. When there isn't the teamwork, it just doesn't work. So that's what hopefully makes the organizations I'm involved with so very special. And I'm lucky that I've been able to work with such special people over so many years. But, but thanks for that question, Jamie. That was a very interesting question. Thank you. So obviously, thank you for um, your answer and uh, the amazing work that um, those people you mentioned are doing. So how do you feel? Um, it, it must be so amazing to know that the whole community supports what the work that Jewish Care are doing. So how do you feel about the amazing response the community have, have had towards what Jewish Care are doing? Jamie, now I recognise you because you've done some of the interviews because I've been looking at you and thinking, <laughs> I know you. Because <laughs> I've seen you on a number of occasions. The answer is we have a fantastic community. We have a community that rise to the occasion. And when I tell people, you know, we brought in in a few days, four million pounds, they say, come on, Michael, you know, pull the other one, you're kidding me. And I say, no, it's true. But we can only do that because of the strength of our community. We have people who've had tremendous success, but they could walk away, they could do other things in their lives, but they feel part of our community. They want to be part of our community. And there's no greater blessing in life than to have had success and to give back. And it's the greatest blessing, Jamie, that one can have. Have success, but share it with others. Share it with those less fortunate than yourself. And our community have been immense. I cannot tell you, I picked up the phone to people and then said, explain what's going on. How has COVID affected the organization? How have you dealt with PPE? How have you dealt with isolating residents? How have you dealt with these issues? And when you explain it to them, the reaction has just been unbelievable. And you know, many people are thinking they're but for the grace of God. And, you know, so many families, so many people have been affected by this horrendous pandemic. And here publicly, I want to applaud our community. I want to give my respect and admiration to our Jewish community because they have been phenomenal. What they've done and the way they've stood by those in need during this terrible period. No one ever dreamt that this would be happening. No one could believe that families couldn't see their loved ones. Children couldn't see their parents. Grandchildren couldn't see their grandparents. Homes were closed. Residents were kept in isolation. We had to take residents back from the hospital without being tested. So we didn't know if they had COVID or not. All of this has been going on and our community has stood solid, rock solid, and that's why we've been able to achieve what we've achieved. And we're blessed with a wonderful community. And when I've asked people, just as another example, to come on and do these evenings and spend an evening with you guys, um, I say in some cases, people said, you know, Michael, should we really do it? And I said, you should. 
because these youngsters, they want to hear from you. They want to see what you've done. They want to understand your life. They want to understand what you do, what you've achieved, why you do what you do. And our community has risen to the challenge. And that's what makes our community so very special. And I'm proud to be part of our community. I'm proud that many organizations have chosen me over the years to lead them. But more importantly, I'm proud of the people that I work with in each of the organizations and the leadership they give and they show. And you guys are our future leaders. I'm probably over 21 now. You guys are going to lead our community for the future. You are going to be our inspirational leadership for the future because it's you guys that are going to count. You guys are going to show how we're going to lead yet again from the front. And you will change things, and rightly so. Each generation has its changes. Each generation does what it thinks is right for that time. And one of the things that bowls me over when I go to camp and when I see six, 700 people and I see kids from other countries there, I just think it's amazing. And I know when I listen to you and I hear the questions you put to me this evening, and I've heard some of the interviews that you've done with others, I know that our community is going to be in very secure and safe hands for the future. Thank you so much. And you don't look a day over 21, don't you, Ari? Thank you so much. No wonder you've been the interviewer and you're as good a schmoozer as me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, we have a lot of questions left to do. So let's speed through them because I know everybody wants to ask their question. So Another are you asking me to though? be shorter on my answers? Is that what you're saying? No, your answers are brilliant, but <laughs> we've got a lot of questions. Okay, fire away. So one from me, how did you meet Tony Blair? And did you know then that he would be destined to become the first Labour Party Prime Minister in 20 years? Well, well, I met him at a dinner where I was the most junior person there. It was the number two at the Israeli embassy, a very close friend, still is to this day, called Gideon Mayer. Tony had just been to Israel for the first time. He came with Cherie to a dinner at Gideon's home. And there was Lord Weidenfeld there. there, were there. You know, I, w I was the, the, the new kid on the block. But somehow Tony took a shine to me. And after dinner, we sat and we had a chat and we had coffee. And he hates me saying it, but he had a bit of a tummy. Yes. And I said, Tony, come on, you don't look that fit. You're 10 years younger than me. Um, well, nine years younger, actually. And I said, come on, start hitting some balls and we get fit. He hates me reminding me of this now. But we just started to play tennis. And the whole family came over. I go to Shawshank this morning. They would come over in the afternoon. They went to church Sunday morning. And then they would come over in the afternoon on Fermil. Tony and I would play tennis, we'd swim, and I really did get him fit. Um, and we just became mates. No one had any idea then that he would become prime minister. He was shadow home affairs spokesman. As I said, the leader then was John Smith. Everyone felt that he'd taken over from Neil Kinnock, that John would become prime minister. Um, and after John, Gordon Brown, who was really more senior than Tony, in those days, he would be the next prime minister or the next leader of the Labour Party, at least. But then John tragically died. And I remember phoning Tony early that morning. And I said, Tony, you've got to go for it. And he said, really? And I said, Jenny, help you need Tony. I'm there for you. And I could see he was already thinking of it. Next thing, he took over as leader in 94 and, of course, became prime minister in 97. So if you'd have said to me at that first dinner party that Tony Blair is going to be the leader of the Labour Party and the next prime minister, again, I'd have said, you're kidding me, because it wasn't on the agenda. No one thought it could happen. The reason the Israeli um, uh, Gideon Mayer hosted him is because he'd just come back from Israel um, on his first visit there. And we were just friends and um, everything changed. Suddenly he became leader of the Labour Party and I was there at the side of the leader of the Labour Party, a close friend, spent so much time with him. Um, and in 95, actually, um, he'd been over in the afternoon, had left. And tragically, it was when Rabin was assassinated. 
and he phoned me and he said, Michael, I feel I want to go to Israel for the funeral. Although I'm not prime minister, I am leader of the Labour Party now. And I said, Tony, we're on an early plane tomorrow. I'm going for the funeral. Let me get you an extra ticket and come. And about two hours late, he phoned and said, look, Michael, Major has asked me to come on the plane with Prince Charles and Paddy Ashdown, leaders of the opposition parties. And I said, no problem, we'll meet up. We met up at the King David Hotel. And I laugh about it now. He had a tiny bedroom. And I brought people up to see him from Shimon Peres up and down to meet him. And then later when I went with him um, as envoy, the whole top floor would be taken for the prime minister and security. Um, it was, it, you know, it was remarkable. And I remember the funeral was quite something. He met top Israelis and top Palestinians. And he said to me, Michael, if I'm lucky enough to be prime minister, I really want to get involved in this region and in this process. And I want you to help me. And I said, Tony, that would be great. And of course, he became prime minister. I went into the Lords in 97, just after he became prime minister. Well, it's 23 years ago, wow. And he asked me to become his personal envoy and advisor on, on the Middle East. But that's how it all started, from a dinner party where no one really dreamt that he would be the leader, let alone the prime minister. Um, and we just became friends and, you know, not really having a clue that one day I would be really, you know, such a close friend of the prime minister of this country. Um, and I had my office in the Foreign and Commonwealth office, um, was in number 10 nearly every day. And, you know, one of those things in life, chance again, opportunity, but little did one dream that that first time I met him at dinner, that that would become a reality. Um, so <laughs> there's the answer. That's, that's the story from beginning to end and as, as honest as I can possibly be with you. Who would have thought? I mean, I was about to ask you about uh, how you started to play tennis with him, but I think our next audience question is going to go into that. So our next question is from Joel Alexander from Borenwood Jail GBA. Hi, John. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, so yes, as Sydney said, um, many of your close friendships seem to cement themselves through playing tennis, be it Tony Blair or the former Speaker of the House, um, John Burko, who hosted several Jail GBA patrons dinners with you. Uh, when did you first start playing tennis and are you disappointed that there's no Wimbledon this year? And uh, what is it about the game that helps you foster your relationships? Well, I didn't start playing tennis actually until my 20s. Um, my sport was athletics and um, as I said, as before, well. I was you know, really a very good sprinter in, in my youth, in my teens. I started playing tennis in my 20s because I thought I had to take up a sport because after I got married, frankly, go to such a great cook, I just <laughs> started to put on weight and I thought, you know, I've got to take up a sport. So it was tennis. I find it a very social game. You can have a good schmooze between games and between sets. Um, and so that's why I took up tennis and I still love tennis. I still play singles, hard game of singles, three times a week. Um, Tony doesn't play as much tennis now. In those days, he loved it. And um, I often used to go to Checkers on a Sunday when he became prime minister and then go to RAF Horton. Um, but then it was also so difficult with the security that I organized for there to be built a court at Checkers and there's now a tennis court at Checkers. Um, Tony's an average player, similar to me. John Burko is a top player. John Burko was junior Wimbledon. He's some tough guy on a tennis court, unbelievably competitive. Um, and I started to play with John, but in the end, I, we ended up playing doubles because John was really a cut above as junior Wimbledon, apart from, you know, he, he can give me a number of years. Um, but John got really turned on to our community. He was a wonderful host for fundraising dinners at Speaker's Residence. Um, and I have to say that we made the kitchen kosher um, and he was very, very 
charming as many of the guests that came to those dinners will tell you. And you know, to go into speaker's residence in parliament, to take in a kosher caterer, to kosher the kitchen, you know, that is something. And that had never happened before in speaker's residence. And likewise, there had never been kosher catering before in the Lords. And many years ago, I host an annual Jewish care lunch at the Lords. We can only do it Friday because we take over one of the kitchens. So we start the lunch early so that it can be well out before Shabbat. And again, they take over the kitchen, the caterer, kosher the place. And, you know, when you think of that, you're going into the heart of government. You're going into the heart of power in this country. And they enable us to have kashrut. They enable us to honor our dietary requirements. And they show our community that respect. You know, you have to sit back and scratch your head and think and just say how blessed we are. But yeah, the tennis, cool. going back to your question on the tennis, it's part of my life. It's something I really enjoy. Um, I played last Sunday with Lewis. He's got to tell you that it was six all. There was a tie break and he just won a tie break. But, you know, he had to get me to say that. Um, <laughs> I was going to say we stopped at six all, but I wanted to be a mensch. Um, <laughs> but I love my tennis. I'm very competitive. And um, I don't like losing, frankly. Um, but that's how I really built relationships. And I certainly, um, you know, tennis was very much part of the building relationship with Tony and part of the relationship of building the relationship with John as well. And I, all of you, I'm sure, do different sports. Um, and I'm sure doing sport helps you build friendships and relationships. And often they last for so many years because you see these partners that you play with on a very regular basis. And that cements very firm and positive friendships. So I would encourage everyone to participate in some sport, whether it's tennis, soccer, whatever it is, cricket, I know, you know, ladies, netball, hockey, whatever it is, um, it does build up wonderful friendship and relationships. So there's my answer on tennis to you. And I still enjoy my tennis and hopefully I pray that I'll be able to play singles for many years to come because I really don't enjoy doubles. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Um, I'm a dancer. So some of my closest friends actually come from dance. And so it's really lovely. Wow. And as you said, good and I still love jiving. <laughs> you know, that was my generation. And, uh, and I still, if you get me at a wedding or a bar mitzvah, you'll see me go nuts in the floor, swinging around. So I still enjoy any type of swinging around and dancing as well. Brilliant. Our next question comes from Alfie Blumino, who goes to Liverpool, JLGB. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? I like Thank that. You. That's cool, man. <laughs> My hair's not the best at the moment. <laughs> Nor was mine until I had a haircut a couple of weeks ago by my daughter. There you go. <laughs> so, you're a <laughs> lifelong Arsenal supporter since childhood. Are you pleased that football has returned? And after all the effort that in finding a way to bring back safely, is it all irrelevant now that Liverpool have won the league? Uh, well, number one, I think Liverpool really deserve to win the league. So, congratulations. I think they're a great team. I'd love to see Klopp at Arsenal. I think he's an absolute genius. Pardon me. So, well done, Liverpool, on winning the league. The truth, I'm totally bored with the football now. I think it lacks atmosphere. It's boring me. I think Arsenal are absolute rubbish at the moment. And I'm not getting any pleasure out of football at all. Truth, I'm finding it very frustrating. Um, I think Arsenal are in a very difficult period and I just feel the lack of crowd, the lack of atmosphere. Um, I'm, I'm hardly watching any games, it's the truth. Um, so if anything, this has very much diluted my appetite for, for football. So there's a straightforward answer, but feel proud of being a Liverpudlian, feel proud of your club and feel proud of Klopp. You've got a great team of players, you've got a great manager and you thoroughly deserve to win the league this year. So warmest congratulations. And as far as Arsenal is concerned, boy, we've got a lot of work to do to get back to a great team again. A lot of work. 
Fair enough, fair enough. Well, thank you very much for answering the question. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you, Alfie. So, another question from me. Today, young Jews were born post the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. And in fact, for some context, I was born in 2003. So I haven't really known a time without conflict in the Middle East. You were Tony Blair's Middle East envoy. How did that role come about? How close did you, Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, actually get to peace in the Middle East? Well, that is some question. Um, first of all, very quickly, how did my role come about? Because really, I very much introduced Tony into the Middle East. I introduced him to, as they say, the runners and riders, the key players in Israel. Um, the, I mean, I remember King Abdullah in Jordan asked me to introduce me, uh, him to Tony. So I really made a lot of the introductions and turned him on um, to the Middle East issues. Um, I did work with Clinton. I did work with, with Blair, with, with Tony and Bill. And I did go around the Middle East so often. I, at one stage, really felt that we were getting close to the possibility of peace, the Oslo Accords. I knew Rabin very well, a blessed memory. He was a wonderful guy. I knew Shimon Peres very well. And I've known most of the Israeli leaders subsequently very well. I had to deal with Arafat. I dealt with Abbas. And if the question would have been, what was the most disappointing thing for you, Michael, in your role of 10 years? My answer would be that there wasn't a deal done with Syria. For some reason, the last Syrian president, Khafas al-Assad, took a shine to me. I was in and out of Damascus and I created the opportunity for the Americans to have Shepherdstown and to try and do a deal on Syria. Tragically, it didn't work. And now we see what's happened with his son taking over Bashar. It's a total mess in Syria. It's, it, it's horrendous what's happened to Syria. But at one stage, I think there was a real possibility of a deal being done. So had there been peace with Egypt, with Jordan, which there is, if Syria would have fallen in and Lebanon would have then fallen in, the topography of the Middle East today would be very different. Do I feel that there is the horizon today for a lasting peace deal as we sit here this evening? Sadly, I think the answer to that is no. There are just too many issues, too many problems. The good news is that the Gulf states are opening relationships. During my role as envoy, I'm very proud that I helped open relationships with Bahrain, with Qatar, with Morocco, with Tunisia, with Oman, with Israel. And that was very, very exciting. Today, with UAE, even to an extent Saudi, there are back channels, there are relationships. We're going through a very difficult period. I'm not going to give a lecture on the rights and wrongs of annexation. I know you've had Mark Regev on, a very dear friend of mine who's just gone back to Israel. I was privileged to have the role that I had. I tried to do it honestly. I tried to do it fairly. It was a very, very difficult role. And I always had the backing of my prime minister. And I remember when I came back from Damascus, when there was a breakthrough and I was called straight into number 10. And Tony said to me, Michael, have you got this right? When the late Assad said to me, now is the time to talk to the Israelis without preconditions. And he said, Michael, I'm gonna get on that hotline and tell Clinton of what you come back with. I hope I'm not making a fool of myself. I said, Tony, I don't speak Arabic. You've seen the confidential memo or cable as it's called from our ambassador. You're not making a fool of yourself. This is what happened. We had two meetings, two days running, which is unheard of with Assad. He phoned Bill Clinton. Three days later, the then Secretary of State Albright was in Damascus because Assad made it clear to me, we'll give the breakthrough to you and your prime minister, 
but the lead must be from the Americans. Sadly, it fell apart. There was a terrible meeting with Clinton and Assad in the January in Geneva after Shepherdstown, and that's probably the biggest regret. Um, very difficult meetings. Uh, I remember one meeting, Erev Yom Kippur, where I had to see Arafat, literally came out of Gaza. And again, the first time that I'd used the phone on Yom Kippur, but I had to make an urgent call to uh, both Tony and Condoleezza Rice, who was then Secretary of State. Um, I had no alternative, but I had to make that call. Um, so some of these things are very, very difficult. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that was it. I made the call and, and, and that was it. But, you know, I was privileged to have this role. I worked hard for 10 years. Tony worked hard for 10 years. He then carried on after he was prime minister as well. Clinton tried very hard. We're now in a very, very different era. And it's not for me to be critical of what's going on. Um, all I can say is, I hope and pray that the leadership all around will have the vision in order to create peace. Because we have a wonderful country it's an amazing region of the world and the only way forward is for there to be peace because without peace we know what the alternative is that's my answer to you and that for me is a very emotional subject so thank you for asking the question well, thank you for sharing that with us so our next question is going to come from former JLGB I will ambassador Luke Levine hi there how are you doing hi Luke um, so everyone's been asking kind of super intense questions. Mine's a little bit more relaxed. Um, Good. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Um, so I'm a massive Star Trek fan and I hear that you not only know, but you got to work with Sir Patrick Stewart campaigning to get Labour elected back in 1997 and that he even attended your son's wedding. Um, did you or Gilda watch Star Trek or see him in the theatre at any point and are you still in touch? Okay, wow, you guys know everything about me. You're beginning to get me worried now. <laughs> so Patrick's a great guy. He's been at our home a number of times for dinner. You're right. He was at my son Daniel's wedding. But here I have to be honest, Gilda's a Star Trek fan. She's a real Trekkie. She's a fanatic Star Trek fan. She couldn't believe it when Patrick came here for the first time for dinner. And I remember some of the guests just ignored Tony because Tony was here. And all they wanted to do was talk to Patrick. And, you know, they were Trekkies. And it was quite funny seeing it. They zoomed in on Patrick and like, Tony was a prime minister. Like, you know, normally everyone was fussing about him. He's a great guy. I've seen him on stage actually in, in New York and he was brilliant. Um, an amazing actor, an amazing human being, and someone I'm proud and privileged to call a good friend. But I'm not the Trekkie in the family. Good as a Trekkie in the family. <laughs> you are still in touch with him then? Patrick, yeah, I could yeah. phone Patrick. I could phone Patrick this evening. I mean, you know, I have his... You daughter. reckon you could get him to come on to JLGB Virtual for us? Oh my God, wow, Lou, that's oh, pushing... The personal me. entertainment, mostly. <laughs> um, I, I, I really don't know. Patrick would rarely do things like that, actually. Um, that's, that's a hard ask. That's a hard ask. And I would be giving you BS if I said to you I could pick up the phone to Patrick and say, hey, come on and do JLGB. I could ask him to do a number of things, well, that may be a hard ask. I'll reflect on it though, because you put me on the spot and I did say before, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> um, but that's, uh, you know, that, that's a tricky one. So yeah, uh, no, that's totally let, 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 let me reflect on that because it's one thing asking in our community for financial support. It's another thing pulling in markers and one has to be very careful. As you know, I pulled in marker, markers for Craig David um, and I won't go more than that. Um, but um, I pulled in a marker for Jewish care with Lionel Richie and the Duke of Cambridge as well. But you know, you can't call in too many markers with these people because then you f they feel you're abusing a friendship. Yeah, and of course. Something, and that's something that I would never do. But that was a very, very good ask. I'm proud of you, that was <laughs> great, okay? Very good. 
Great, thanks so much. <laughs> I'm not a massive Star Trek fan, so thanks for asking that, Luke, because I definitely wouldn't have been able to. <laughs> Our next question comes from Guy Sandler from Birmingham JLGB. Hi, Guy. Hi. Um, thank you very much for coming on and for kind of sharing specifically like your incredibly long and very influential political career and what you're saying about international relations and your role as an envoy. It's all really interesting. But kind of regarding your role in the Labour Party, in recent years, despite great pressure, you made the quite brave decision to remain within the party and fight anti-Semitism from within, as opposed to a lot of MPs that left, like Ian Austin or Luciana Berger. But now that Jeremy Corbyn's gone and Sir Keir Starmer is the new leader of the Labour Party, are you happy with what you've seen so far, especially kind of in recent days, that the issue of anti-Semitism and with Rebecca Long Bailey is finally being addressed quite heavily. Wow, I thought they were getting lighter, the questions, they're getting tougher. Okay, I believe you fight from within because from within you've got influence. I would have had headlines for a couple of weeks, national television headlines in the newspaper, Lord Levy leaves Labour, the most high profile Jew in the Labour Party, so what? Many of you probably saw me on the media and I couldn't have been more critical of Corbyn and the way he was handling things. To be critical from within is what I did. I discussed this with Tony Blair on many occasions, says, Michael, you've got to stay in. And I stayed in and it was very tough and it was very difficult and sometimes very ugly. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people would come up to me and just really, really have a go. Michael, how can you stay in Labour? You know, we love you. Look what you do. But how can you be part of the Labour Party? And, you know, a number of years ago when I took in quite a number of Labour peers, as you know, there are two supporters when you go in the Lords. On one occasion, some friends in the Lords were standing there and they said, Michael, that was horrible. When you were taking in somebody, they were just saying, oh, this is on the Tory benches, by the way. Who's the Jew boy bringing in now? There are horrible incidents continually on anti-Semitism. And when I was critical of Corbyn, there were threats on me. Someone was basically taken to court for a threat on my life. And as many of you know, when I was envoy, I had very heavy security um, all the time. And this person then fled the country and they're not allowed back in. It was tough. It was ugly and it was tough. But the way to fight is to fight from within and get your point over. And that doesn't mean that I supported Corbyn in any way. And no one could have been more critical in the media than I was about him. You know, politics is a pendulum and it swings. And if you tell me there are no anti-Semites in other political parties, I would say to you, please don't be so naive. It's been a very tough period for Labour. And we now have a new leader. I know Keir, he's been to our home. Um, I've met with him privately a number of occasions. And I think things will change. But you know, politics is a very personal thing. And everyone, when they go in that polling booth, they decide who they want to vote for, the reasons they want to vote for a leader, the reasons they want to vote for a political party, and what their beliefs are. And I've always been just left to centre, but just left to centre. It was me that gave Tony the really theme for the election in 97. I remember now, now swinging in the pool and Tony said, come on, Michael, what's our theme? Then I stopped and I said, Tony, you know, the Tories have always had all the ambition, but they really lack compassion. Labour has always had all the compassion, but has really lacked ambition. I think it would be a great line, ambition with compassion. I remember he stopped and he said, wow. And then the Tories copied it years later with compassionate conservatism. But I'm not a fanatic in politics. I really am not. 
I believe what's best for this country. I'm privileged to have grown up in this country and I've been blessed with my life and how this country has treated me. And for a poor Jewish kid from Hackney to have been in the Lords and to be envoy of the Prime Minister, I think that's quite remarkable. I'm very fortuitous and very lucky. So I'm not someone who's a turncoat. Tony Blair put me in the Lords as a Labour peer. I didn't want to go on the cross benches, so I decided to stick it out. It was a very difficult period. I think things will change now, and I think things will change for the better. But I hope all forms of anti-Semitism, all forms of racism, no matter what, in every political party should be eradicated because our country is better than that. And politics shouldn't be about subjects like that. It should be about making this country better, making our education better, making our health service better, making our social services better. And that's what politics should be about. And it's been a very difficult period in politics. And I very much hope it's behind us um, for good. So that's the most honest answer I can give you. And I very much appreciate you asking that question. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking that question, Guy. So another tougher one for me, sorry. But in 2007, during a quite difficult and painful period in your life, you were asked if you become the new JLGB president. Why did you say yes if you had already done so much for the community? So why I take on this new challenge of supporting the Jewish youth? That's a very, very good question. Um, and I wasn't sure at the beginning whether I really wanted to take on another role and another responsibility. Um, so I found out more about JLGB. I found out more about its history, more about what it did. And I just felt there was a real opportunity there for the organization to develop in terms of changing and in terms of serving our youth. As a young guy, I went to a youth club and those youth clubs didn't exist any longer. And in JLGB, I saw an organization that could really help our youngsters, develop our youngsters, develop their personalities, and really make a change and you have groups as you know you guys are on from cardiff birmingham leeds manchester glasgow warrenwood elstree bushy redbridge it's fantastic and i saw what the organization was doing and i always have to question myself can i make a change can i make a difference can i help and i thought you know what I think I can. And at the beginning it was difficult because there was a certain culture within the organization that I had to understand. But then I'm delighted I made the decision to become the president. And when I see the organization today, um, under Neil's leadership and under Norman Terrett's chairmanship, and I see the board of trustees, I just say, wow. But most importantly, I see you youngsters, I see the questions, I see who you are, what you are, what you stand for. And I can envisage what you're going to achieve in your lives. And I see how you're working the Evolve program, the D of E scheme. I mean, it's just fantastic. And JLGB is 125 years young and it's going to be there long after I've gone. And I'm just very, very proud of what I've been able to help with, with JLGB. And I just watched so many of the interviews you've done. And I myself had these questions put to me tonight. And I just say, wow, JLGB guys feel very proud you're part of it because it's very special. And strangely enough, when I speak to people, they say, oh, you know what? I was in JLGB, Michael. I had great times there. And I wasn't a part of JLGB when I was a youngster, um, perhaps to my regret. But I see now what you're doing and what you're achieving. And I feel honoured and proud that you've allowed me to be your president. So thank you. Well, thank you for being the president. I mean, the opportunities that JLGB have provided me and so many other members out there 
are just incredible and so really do feel proud to be a member of such an amazing organization our next question is going to be from emma solomons from cardiff jlgb hi hi emma um, so for JLGB members, volunteering, youth social action and helping others is a part of our DNA. But right now we are snookered. How would you like to see young people get back to face-to-face -face volunteering safely as lockdown is eased? And what role might youth have to play in getting the country back to normal eventually? Well, I'd love to say that we're in power, but we're not in power. And you know, opposition is about talking. Being in power is about doing. And I was very privileged that, you know, we were in power for a long period and through the Blair years and then obviously afterwards in the Brown period. We've been in opposition a long time. So sadly, opposition is about talking, is about trying to hold government to account. But it's the government that are going to make those decisions. And sadly, I wish I could be part of making those decisions. But we're in a very, very difficult period. We look at what's going on in the States. We look at what's going on in Brazil, in Mexico. We look at countries that are opening up. We look here in what's just happened in Leicester. And, you know, this is a very, very scary time. Um, this pandemic has, well, for me personally, it's been tragic in the friends that I've lost. But so many families have been affected. And my only advice that I can give you is we have to listen to what we're told. We have to play the game within the rules. We have new ways in life with Zoom, with video, that can we relate to people, that we can have social action, that we can help others, that we can speak to others who need some help. Going out and about, um, frankly, as long as one is allowed to do that with the right protection, um, it's much more difficult. But as long as one, again, plays within the rules, the one thing you guys can't do, and that is forget the things that you stand for and the things that you want to do to help others. But we have to play within a different set of rules in helping others today. And we should never break those rules because it's too dangerous to do so. So the only thing I can say to you is, I wish I could make the changes and wave a magic wand. I wish my party were in power again. I now sit on opposition benches. But as far as all of you are concerned, I know what's in your DNA. I know you want to help others. Try and help them as much as you can in any way you can during this period. But as far as going to the future is concerned, once you can get back out there in doing what you do and what you do best, do it, but don't feel bad about this period when you can't do everything that you'd want to do because none of us can, and no matter what our age. So that's the best answer I can give you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Emma. So what's next for you, Michael? What does the future hold? I mean, just when we thought you might start to ease up, you recently became the president of the disability charity Sense and Sense International. We, of course, want you to lead our community for many more years to come, as does every charity that you support. But what do you hope that your legacy will be? Well, wow. Well, first of all, Sense and Sense International, I was president of Volunteering Matters, the largest volunteering charity for 21 years. And I felt that I needed to move on. And I all, and many charities approached me. And I always like to do things in wider society as well. And Sense looks after deaf and blind and the most disabled. And the patron is Princess Anne, who I've been getting on great with. She's a wonderful lady. Um, and I just decided that that would be the, the charity that I would um, become the, the, the president of. You know, there's a saying, always give a job to a busy man because he's the guy who's going to deal with it and do it. Um, I like to be active. I like to do things. 
I like to have a positive impact and I like to help wherever I can. In terms of my legacy, that's for others to judge. Um, I've always tried to give the best of what I can to every organization I've been involved with. I've always tried to give the best to our community and to wider society. Um, but in terms of how people judge you, ultimately, it's for them to make the judgment. All I can do is to do my best. All I can do is to try and help others to the best of my ability, to maintain the relationships, to maintain my friendships, and to work with others. How ultimately I will be judged will be for others to make that decision. And it would be arrogant of me and wrong of me to say what I feel my legacy should be. Others will determine that. As far as I'm concerned, as long as I do my best, as long as I give the best that I can of myself to whoever I work with, and as long as I can keep active, and as long as I can really keep going and put in a long, hard day every day, then that's the Almighty blessing me. As to how I'm judged ultimately, hopefully it will be in a good light. But that will be for others to determine. Brilliant answer. So finally, we always ask our guests to nominate and ask another celebrity or community leader to be the future guest on our programme and help entertain all the children and young people stuck at home. Behind the scenes, you have already helped persuade so many guests already. But using your own fundraising techniques, you have taught us this evening and being bold and knowing that it's for a good cause, I'm just going to go for it. Do you think you'll be able to ask Tony to be our guest in season two? Say that again. <laughs> Do you reckon you can get Tony Blair on? Wow, I just called in a mark for Tony for my rabbi. I just got him to do um, an interview with my rabbi for the whole of the United Synagogue. I just got Sadiq Khan to do it for my rabbi. And I'm going to do it myself for the whole of the United Synagogue. Um, ding, 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 ding. That's a toughie, boy. Um, Tony won't do a long interview, that's for sure. Whether I can get him to do a short interview, you set me a challenge. I like it. Do a short interview. I will take your challenge, Cindy, and I give you my word that um, uh, I promise you this, Sydney, that I will um, ask him when I speak to him on Sunday, because we've arranged to speak this Sunday, I will ask him. I want to tell you, boy, you're going to go a long way if you've got chutzpah. <laughs> I have to ask that. But, you know, I like to rise to a challenge, but I'm not going to make a promise. I will promise you I will ask him. He will only do a very short interview if he does it, um, but it will be a fun interview. Um, he's a great guy. And I promise I will ask Tony this weekend. Had I not just asked him to do the interview with my rabbi, it would have been an easier ask. But having just pulled a favor from him, it's going to be very, very tough to ask for another one. But I give you my word, I will ask him. I didn't expect that from you. Well done for asking me. And I promise that I will ask him. And I know in the background, Neil Martin must have put you up to that, Sydney. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see you nodding your head. Boy, he's a cheeky one. Okay, you've got my word I'm going to ask Tony. Whether he'll do it or not, I don't know. And as I've said, I've just pulled in a big marker from him. So we'll have to wait and see. You've got my word I will ask him. Let's wait and see. Okay. Well, your word is brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Michael, for joining us this evening and for inspiring us all. We have really loved hearing about your fascinating life and experiences and to hear all about the incredible work you continue to do for our community. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you for your continued support of JLGB for so many years. You've been outstanding in helping JLGB to support children and young people before and during lockdown 
and on behalf of all of our trustees, staff, volunteers, and of course us young people, we really want to make sure that you know you will always have our gratitude and appreciation. Long may it continue for many, many more years to come. Stay safe, send our love to Lady Levy, who will be joining us in a few weeks time, and we hope to see you back here very, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. God bless. Thank you. That's it. Thank you to everybody for tuning in this evening for the final show of season one of JLGB Virtual.